Good evening, everyone, and welcome to the Ford Presidential Museum. My name is Elaine Didier, and it's my privilege to serve as director of the museum here in Grand Rapids and the library in Ann Arbor. We are very pleased to have you with us for our second speaker of our winter program series, and what a winter it has been and continues to be. So we're especially glad that you braved the elements to be here tonight. This evening's program is brought to you by the public-private partnership between the National Archives and Records Administration, of which we are a part, and the Ford Presidential Foundation, which supports so many of our public programs, exhibits, and educational outreach. In addition, tonight we are honored to introduce Mercantile Bank as a special sponsor of this event. And I can tell you, since our speaker was at the Nixon Library Thursday evening with David Hume Kennerly, who was President Ford's lead photographer, I have already secret intelligence to tell you we're in for a really good show. <laughs> I do my homework. Before I turn things over to Bob Worthington to introduce our speaker, I'd like to alert you to upcoming programs at the museum. We have a tremendous number of exciting programs coming this winter and spring. First of all, on Tuesday, March 25th, we will continue to celebrate President Ford's centennial year with a program on the late James Cannon's book, Gerald Ford, An Honorable Life, which was published by the University of Michigan Press in 2013. This is a program that was scheduled for October of 2013 and then had to be rescheduled because of the government shutdown. So please come and join Jim Cannon's sons, Scott and Jim, for a conversation which will be moderated by Professor Barry Rabe of the Ford School of Public Policy. If you're unable to come on that Tuesday night here in Grand Rapids, we encourage you to come join us in Ann Arbor on Wednesday night for a reprise of that program. Looking forward into April when maybe it will be spring, we're having Yannick Michkowski, who is the author of Eisenhower's Sputnik Moment, The Race for Space and World Prestige. Yannick is the author of a prior book titled Gerald Ford and the Challenges of the 70s. He spoke at the library in January, and we're bringing him back so that our West Michigan audience can hear him as well. Going forward, April 8th is Betty Ford's birthday, and we're hosting Rosalind Carter, First Lady, and that will be a luncheon at the JW Marriott and followed by a Spectrum Health Symposium here at the museum. And then moving forward to May on the 13th, Rick, Rick Atkinson, who you may have heard here before, has published the third volume of his Liberation Trilogy. The title is The Guns at Last Light, The War in Western Europe, 1944 and 45. This is a joint program with the Howenstein Center at Grand Valley and will be held at the Eberhard Center across the way. Then, in June, it's the anniversary of D-Day. Think about this. June 4th, we're having John McManus, who's going to speak on the dead and those about to die. D-Day, the big one at Omaha Beach. This is two days before the 70th anniversary of D-Day and the reunion of the 501st Airborne here at the museum. So we're very excited about that. And then beyond, in July, it is Gerald Ford's 101st birthday. There will be the traditional wreath laying, the opening of a new feature exhibit titled Taking the Seas, the Rise of the American Carrier. We're working very hard on that right now, and I think you'll be very excited about our results. And there will be a luncheon address by Secretary James Baker over at the Amway. We have flyers in the lobby about all of these events, and we hope you can join us for many of them. Before we get started, one item of housekeeping, please turn off your cell phones and electronic devices. I'm sure you've already done that. And at this time, it's my pleasure to introduce Bob Worthington, Senior Vice President, General Counsel, and Risk Management Director at Mercantile Bank, who will introduce our very distinguished speaker. Thanks again for coming. Bob? Busted. <laughs> you know, I, I can still remember how it felt, and it's been over a decade ago. I was, I was a young CPA over at Crow Chiswick across the river. If you open up the shade, uh, their building is right across the way. It's now Crow Horwath. And I entered into the third floor reception area, and there was a group of people huddled around the television set. Well, apparently, a plane 
had run into the World Trade Center. As I continued on to my desk, I couldn't help but think, wow, I mean, what a, what a fluke accident. How does something like that happen? And then I heard those words that still haunt me today. A second plane had crashed into the other tower of the World Trade Center. And it was at that moment in history that we all knew this wasn't an accident. We were under attack. Well, you know the rest of the story. Or do you? Our speaker tonight had a front row seat to that moment in history and many others. He was the chief White House photographer for the entire eight years of George W. Bush's presidency. He was special assistant to the president. He was also the first White House photographer to be named a commissioned officer of a U.S. president. He converted an antiquated film-based photo office to a high-tech digital office. He also took nearly a million pictures documenting the presidency, and that's a lot of clicks. Um, and before his time in the White House, he spent eight years with the Associated Press. During his time with the AP, he covered a number of international and domestic issues, presidential campaigns, uh, natural disasters, a number of things overseas, including civil unrest in third world countries, all kinds of sporting events, including five Olympic Games, two World Cups, World Series, Super Bowls, you name it, he's been there. He currently lives with his bride in New Mexico, where he is a freelance photographer with a very, very impressive client list. So without further ado, I give you Eric Draper. Thank you, Bill. Uh, it's a great uh, introduction. I'll, I'll pay you later. No. <laughs> um, so, uh, first of all, uh, I want to. I'm very honored to be here, uh, and I want to thank the Ford Library and the Ford Foundation for bringing me out here. I would love to thank Joe for the idea, for bringing me out here to talk about my book, uh, to talk about my eight years as the chief White House photographer, and and uh, there's the the cover of the book. Uh, front row seat. Very, very proud of this body of work. Um, and so what I'd like to do is, is uh, walk through some photos from the book, but also uh, tell you about how I got the job, because that, that's the number one question I get, uh, and, and that is, you know, how do you become the White House photographer? And For me, it all began uh, as an assignment uh, for the Associated Press, um, never ever thinking it would lead to the White House. Um, I was the lead photographer on the Bush campaign, and actually I started in 1999 uh, on the road. Um, and at the end of it all, you might remember uh, the, re the recount. Uh, you might remember that you know, the election was not decided that night, and that gave me the time to actually pursue the position. So while the chads were being counted in Florida, I was back home in Albuquerque uh, thinking about, you know, I can, I can do this job. I, I, I need to you know, find out more. And, uh, and then uh, I saw the window open up. Uh, I discovered I was invited to a Christmas party in Austin, Texas, and uh, it was perfect timing. Pre uh, Governor Bush had just become President-elect Bush. He invited staff and journalists who, who traveled on the campaign trail to, to the governor's mansion. So I decided to take a page out of his political playbook. Thank you. And uh, during his campaign, he would always say, I'm going to look you in the eye and ask you for the job. I want to be your president. So that's what I did. So at the party, uh, with my wife coaching me on the sidelines to make my move, and, <laughs> and I walked up to uh, President-elect Bush, and I said, thank you for inviting us to the party. By the way, I want to be your personal photographer. And I didn't blink. And, uh, and he looked at me, and, and that was the longest handshake of my life. Uh, and he said, you know, I really appreciate that and I'll get back to you. And a week later, uh, I was back in Austin, Texas, sitting in front of Chief of Staff Andy Card, who pretty much offered me the job on the spot. Uh, he knew my work, uh, and I'll never forget, there are two things he told me. He said that, uh, first of all, he asked me, can I manage? Uh, because I had an office to run, and of course I said yes. 
uh, I really wanted the job. Um, and he also said that working in the White House was like trying to drink water through a fire hose at full throttle. And he was right. 9-11, uh, the war in Afghanistan, the war in Iraq, the uh, shuttle Columbia disaster, funerals for two presidents and a pope, uh, the worst uh, U.S. national disaster in history, the worst economic crisis since the Great Depression. Uh, I traveled to nearly, nearly 70 countries with President Bush, 49 states. Sorry, Vermont, didn't, didn't make it out there. Um, uh, like Bill said, I, I made nearly one million images, and the, the storage for the database for uh, the eight years came in around 50 terabytes of information. So and Andy Cart was right. It was, it was huge. Uh, so what I'd like to do is uh, look at some photos from the book, starting with, uh, turn on the remote here. So there I am. That's, uh, uh, by the way, I'm the guy, uh, <laughs> if, you don't, if you can't recognize me on the uh, second from left, um, but you know, my job was incredible for eight years, uh, and I, it was such a privilege to be, to be able to, uh, to tell the story of the 43rd president uh, from day one. And uh, the first chapter in my book is called The Beginning, and, uh, and this is the beginning, the, uh, the, the president-elect arriving at the White House the morning of the inauguration on January 20th, 2001, and the Clintons are waiting to greet them. It's a very cold, rainy day. Inside the, uh, the traditional coffee with the incoming president and the outgoing president in the blue room of the White House. Um, and you see there the, the regular suspects in that image. So, um, so what I tried to do was, was uh, you know, use my background as a photojournalist uh, to tell the story, to capture uh, images that uh, people can look at and, and, know, and know what's happening. Like this is the uh, first signature as president at the Capitol after the swearing in ceremony. President George W. Bush enters the Oval Office for the very first time. Um, this is after the parade, and, uh, and, and by the way, the, inside the West Wing is like chaos. You, the new administration cannot touch anything until 12.01 p.m. on, on the 20th. Uh, and, uh, but when that happens, it, I mean, there's, there are carpenters pulling carpet out, they're painting, they're moving furniture around, and, and at this time, I was discovering where my office was, and my office has a little history. It, it, it was the old barber shop in the basement of the West Wing. But, you know, location's everything, right? So I, uh, I could be in the Oval Office in about 12 seconds. I actually timed it one day. Uh, my desk sat in front of the original mirror that was still there. Um, and, and i never forget, uh, before this moment happened, that my, the phone rings in my office, and someone said, uh, Eric, you need to get to the Oval Office right away. The president's headed there. But I didn't know where the Oval Office was. <laughs> it's my first time in the West Wing. Uh, and I grab my cameras, and I go screaming through the hall, uh, Everyone was kind of pointing me in the right direction. I, luckily, I ended up, ended up in the Rose Garden, uh, which was the perfect spot because the president was walking over from the residence, and he had a gaggle of people behind him. He was leading, and I backpedaled into the Oval Office to make this picture. And uh, moments later, he's joined by his father. So the president sits at the Oval Office desk for the first time. That, that's the famous Resolute desk. Uh, and what you have here, you have, you have you know, history in the making. You have two presidents together, only the second son of a president to become president, the first being John Q. Adams. You have um, a father, proud father with his son, uh, a son, proud moment. And then there's always the story behind the story. So you notice that cord coming from the wall to the chair? Well, that's a massage chair. And at this very moment, President Bush is turning it on, which is leading to the laughter at this moment. And by the way, that, that chair was gone the next morning. I like to call this photo, uh, Timing is Everything, because uh, this was made the first week of the administration. And, and what I love about this picture, this is a great example of how timely President Bush was, because he, loved, he, he ran a tight ship. He, he started his meetings on time or early, typically early. He felt that uh, keeping people waiting for him was rude. 
Um, and I, so I love, I love this moment. And I love capturing the, the surprise moments through all the, the, the formality and the protocol and the schedules, uh, just waiting for, for surprise moments I really loved. This is what the Oval Office looked like uh, in November of 2001. And you notice the rug is blank because uh, this is before the president's rug was designed. And every president gets to decide what uh, the design of their rug. They get to decide what desk they use. Uh, you know, that's the famous Resolute desk, uh, the desk that uh, John Kennedy used. You might remember that famous black and white photo of John John Kennedy poking his head out. Uh, Reagan used the desk. He actually put the riser on. You see on the bottom there to make it a little taller so his knees can clear. Um, uh, the president's father actually had the desk in the residence. And uh, Clinton used the desk, and, and uh, President Obama is using the, the desk as well. This is what the Oval Office looked like in 2003. You notice that's the rug designed by the president. A chapter in my book, uh, the second chapter is called Life in the Bubble. Uh, and that is the Oval Office from, ab from above. I decided to mount a camera in the Oval Office just to show what, you know, what happens in the Oval Office during a typical day. And uh, this is actually uh, what the, the Oval Office looks like when there's a full press pool event with all the photographers and reporters. And this is a, the final meeting with the President of Mexico. And what I loved about the Oval Office, it, it, people, uh, all walks of life would, would enter the Oval Office to meet the President, from a Boy Scout to an old friend from Texas to a new world leader. That's uh, President Hamid Karzai from Afghanistan. This is his first visit to the Oval Office in 2003. And I love capturing that reaction that everyone has when they walk in and they see the president standing there and they, they walk through that door for the first time. There are powerful moments like this one in 2002 with the Martin Luther King family. That uh, on the left is the late Coretta Scott King who's holding the plans for the MLK Memorial. Uh, and at this moment, uh, I was about to walk out because typically my routine would be to kind of photograph the top of the meeting and then give them some room and some privacy and come back at the end. And as I was walking out, I heard uh, Coretta Scott King ask the president, will you pray with, our, with my family? And the president said, of course. I got lucky there. <laughs> so this is not an example of the relationship with the president and Mrs. Bush. Don't get me in trouble. <laughs> this is actually inside Buckingham Palace, and uh, this is in, uh, I think this was 2006 and, uh, or 2005, and the president and, and the first lady were like kids. They're running around like, oh, come take your picture over here, and they're, they're having fun. And speaking of having fun, the president himself had a wonderful sense of humor. Uh, he kept the staff laughing. He, he was always typically the most positive person in the room, and on this particular day, in 2003, a box shows up in the Oval Office uh, on the desk, and he opens it up, and this, this, it's a full boxing robe that he pulls out with his name on the back. And he, This is very early in the morning, so there's no one else around. So it, he, he put it on, and he's looking around for someone to show it off to. <laughs> Here's another surprise moment. Again, another gift. And the, you know, the, the president had to take this, this fold-up bike for a spin in the, in the halls of the West Wing. And, what I love about this photo is that Secret Service agent on the left keeping a straight face. <laughs> and uh, the president with his dog Barney, uh, he called Barney the son he never had. He, he loved Barney. Um, this is back when the president was a runner before he started biking. And the other dog, that's uh, Miss Beasley, the other Scottish Terrier. Miss Beasley was more affectionate, so she would show up. And, and these moments in the Oval Office were, were fleeting. They would last for, for just a few seconds and then, the, then on to the seriousness of the day. I have a chapter in my book called Family, which for me was just a bonus. I mean, I had the, the, the presidency to document, I had the president's life, but then the history of the Bush family uh, in front of me. Uh, you know, whenever his parents would visit, it was always magical to me because, first of all, uh, he, and, he and his father looked so alike. Uh, and one of the first things I learned is when you say Mr. President, they both turn around. <laughs> so referring to them, you know, President 41 and President 43 always helped. This is the family uh, during an Easter brunch at the ranch in Crawford, Texas. 
and uh, the two presidents at the, the family compound in Kinney Buckport, Maine. And, uh, and you can tell who's the retired president and who's the <laughs> working president. Uh, the two presidents together uh, years later at Camp David, and uh, I had them sit for a photographic portrait just for me uh, because I wanted to get that, that strong, uh, that resemblance of them together, um, and I, I love that portrait. Uh, his father would show up for lunch a lot you know, private, in the private dining room, and, um, and, and, they're, and they're just so normal. I mean, he would, they would sit down and he would say, well, son, what did you do today? And he'd say, well, Dad, I just got off the phone with the president of Russia. And, you know, just, you know, typical father-son talk, right? And that portrait there, uh, that's the a portrait of John Q. Adams. Uh, and the president really admired him, and he had that portrait hanging in the entire eight years. One of my favorite things to do was to go to the ranch. Uh, I love the ranch in Crawford, Texas, unlike a lot of the media. Um, for one thing, I didn't have to wear a suit, which was great. Uh, it was very relaxed. Uh, but, but to document the president as a Texan was, was just a joy to me. Uh, uh, it, it was, you know, he had some, some privacy. He had 1,600 acres to roam. Uh, he had his, his favorite fishing buddy there, Barney. The ranch was the only place where he can drive his own truck, in this image here. Um, and what you can't see, Barney is on his lap. And he was very proud of his ranch. He would give give tours for, uh, for visitors, uh, for staff, for uh, visiting world leaders. He would take them on a, on a road tour. And like I said, the ranch was more relaxed. This is uh, inside the president's private, private study. And there's, a, there's a, another Barney moment. Uh, I actually contributed to this moment when the president uh, saw me on my stomach on the ground taking a picture, and he didn't know Barney was under the bench, and, I, and he's like, Eric, what are you doing, right? And I said, well, sir, Barney's under the bench. And he said, what? And he looked down. <laughs> and I said, thank you, sir. <laughs> <laughs> that's the, uh, the presidential helicopter flying over this amazing sky over Waco, Texas, and that's not Photoshop. That's how it looked. It's really, really incredible. That's in 2004. And uh, the, the job of the the presidency would follow the, the president everywhere. I mean, uh, he had staff with him. There were trailers uh, adjacent to the ranch. Uh, one trailer was, was actually like a mini situation room where he can really talk to anyone in the world in real time in a video conference. Uh, his schedule operated just as if he was in Washington. And uh, so I could prepare for a lot of things, but nothing could prepare me for September 11th, 2001. I was with President Bush at the elementary school in Sarasota, Florida that morning. And uh, these are the next series of pictures are from that day and the, the days that followed. And, and for me, um, you know, that moment, uh, you know, we, we arrived at the school knowing that there was a horrific accident in New York City, not ever thinking it could be anything else other than a, a tragic uh, a disaster. Uh, and I didn't know, you know, I saw the president's face change when Andy Card whispered in his ear. And, but until I walked into the hold room here, and this is what you see, that image of the, the live images of the burning towers, then I knew uh, something terrible was happening. And I, and I knew that I had to not leave, uh, did not want to leave the president's side. Uh, and so I was stunned by that image. And, and the president walked into the room, and the first thing he did was walk over to that table, grab a notepad, and start writing. He, he was collecting his thoughts for his first statement to the nation and to the world. And I was waiting for the moment for him to stop and look up, because everyone in the room was just stunned by that image of the burning towers. But he never looked up. He was so focused on his words. And it wasn't until, you see, around 9.25 on, on the clock, when um, they're replaying the video of the second tower getting hit. And Dan Bartlett, who served as the president's communications director, saw it happening on the TV and pointed and said, hey, look, um, alerted everyone in the room, and that's when the president turns finally to see that image that's burned into everyone's memory of Flight 175 hitting the South Tower for the very first time. Approximately 10 a.m. aboard Air Force One, at this stage, the vice president had been evacuated from the West Wing to a secure location Flight 77 
has crashed into the Pentagon. Flight 93 has been hijacked. The entire U.S. airspace has been shut down at this stage. And what's happening here in this image, uh, Andy Card and the president are literally having an argument because the president really wanted to return to Washington. And Andy Card was trying to tell him diplomatically you know, that it was not safe and it was not, it was not going to happen. And it got very heated. And uh, again, uh, the president being told <laughs> that it was not safe to return to Washington. He's, he's with his staff, including uh, uh, there's an Air Force colonel, uh, Colonel Gould, on the left, who was the military aide. Uh, and he wasn't happy because he really wanted to leave the Oval Office. Uh, and around this time, we started hearing a lot of false reports aboard the plane. We heard that a car bomb exploded in front of the State Department, which was false. We heard that a fast-moving object was headed towards the president's ranch, which was false. And then the most surreal moment came when the president himself walked out of the cabin, and he said, I just heard that Angel is the next target, and Angel is the code name for Air Force One. Approximately 10.30, the president views uh, the live television of the collapse of the Twin Towers. And uh, in terms of just this utter silence, uh, he just stood there for several minutes, didn't say a word, and just watched. And, and it was just a horrific moment to experience. Uh, one of our first stops was uh, uh, Barksdale Air Force Base in Louisiana. And we were on the ground for a couple of hours, and you can sense the president's frustration was growing because he really wanted to get back to Washington. And it wasn't until uh, later we, we ended up uh, stopping at Offutt Air Force Base. Uh, and then finally we learned that we're headed to Washington around this stage. And for me personally, uh, my wife had just moved to D.C. five days prior to 9-11. And I was praying that she was home <laughs> that, that time. And she actually was home. And uh, they finally allowed staff to call from the plane as we were approaching Washington. And, uh, I never forget that phone call. She answered, and the first words to her were, my words were, uh, honey, I'm going to be home a little late tonight. <laughs> and I could hear her uh, laughing through her tears, but I was so relieved that she answered the phone. And as we approached Washington, we, uh, we noticed the fighter jets escorting Air Force One, because apparently they had been with us the entire day, but until we got closer to Washington, we hadn't seen them. And that's what's happening in this picture here, the president and the staff looking out the window, and that's the scene there, the uh, fighter jets nearly touching the wings of Air Force One. And this is the scene out of the left side of the plane, and out of the right side of the plane, you can still see the plume of smoke rising from the Pentagon as we approached Washington. And the president finally uh, was able to meet face-to-face -face with the vice president in uh, the bunker, uh, the, uh, the so-called bunker, the uh, the, the PIOC, the Presidential Emergency Operations Center, which I didn't know existed before 9-11. Fast forward, uh, three days later, the president visited Ground Zero. Uh, and this was a, an emotional roller coaster this entire day. It started out in Washington, where the president uh, attended a prayer service at the National Cathedral. He delivered some remarks there. Uh, we traveled to New York City. I'll never forget, as we approached the city aboard the helicopter, and I was inside Marine One with the president. You can smell the smoke filling the cabin as we approached uh, the city. On the ground, you can still feel the heat from the disaster. And, and, and just seeing it personally, you saw the, the, just the size and the, the mountains of debris, nearly three, four stories high. Um, but more importantly, the firefighters, uh, it, was, it was like we we're standing on a raw nerve. They were, they were tired, they were frustrated, and they were angry. And um, they're walking up to the president. They're saying, um, go get him, George. And you can feel the moment building to the, the bullhorn moment. And President Bush delivered when he stepped aboard the rubble. Uh, and it all happened very, very naturally. I mean, the, the, he, uh, a staff member handed him a bullhorn so everyone can hear him. And then the uh, retired firefighter, Bill Beckwith, was there to basically mark the spot for him to stand. But the president said, you stay here with me. And that's when the president delivered the famous line, uh, I can hear you, the world hears you, and the people who knock these buildings down will hear from all of us. 
And uh, being at the White House for eight years, I was able to witness stories come full circle. And the firefighter that prompted uh, the words, you know, that, that famous line, the firefighter that screamed, I can't hear you, I can't hear you, the president met him years later and actually found this guy in, at a political uh, campaign rally in Pennsylvania. And he's in the crowd screaming, I can't hear you, I can't hear you, I'm the guy, I'm the guy. And, uh, and it was true, it was him. Uh, he had pictures, and so I, I said, you know what, and his name was, uh, he was a New York City firefighter, he was retired at the time, his name was Rocco Ciricelli, and I said, you know what, I've got to get you backstage to meet the president. And I got him backstage, it was a very emotional meeting um, after the event. Both men are crying and they're standing together, and the firefighter, Rocco, said, to the president, you know, uh, you know, my son's going to West Point, you know, you've changed my life. And the president stops him, puts his hand on his shoulder and said, no, you changed my life. After uh, visiting with the firefighters at Ground Zero, the president met for nearly three hours with the families of uh, the, the missing. Uh, and there was just a shred of hope, hope at this time that that maybe some survivors are being found, but, but none were, were found. Was, this is the, the most intense situation I've ever had the photograph in th through, in the eight years. It was really hard to even lift the camera. I was, I was confronted a couple of times by some family members who didn't know what I was doing, or, you know, and it, it, it was hard to defend myself. And so I had to very carefully uh, uh, work around this situation. And the president hugged and cried with every one of them. And it was, it was so intense that a lot of staff members just had to walk out to recover, to come back. It was very, very intense. During the meeting with the families, the president was given a badge um, by uh, Arlene Howard, who was the mother of George Howard, a uh, New York Port Authority officer who died on 9-11, and he died wearing this badge. And the pres uh, Arlene Howard gave the, the, the badge to the president, and she told the president, don't you, don't you forget my son. And President Bush said, don't you worry, I'll never forget. And uh, the president carried this badge around in his pocket in the days and months that followed 9-11. He would pull it out and tell the story of George Howard. And so I felt it was very important uh, symbolically to photograph the badge in his hand. And so one day in the Oval Office, I had that opportunity. So uh, I have a chapter in the book also that's called uh, War President. Um, this m image is made uh, right before the war in Afghanistan started. That's uh, a meeting at Camp David with uh, CIA Director George Tenet. And so 9-11 was, was definitely, you know, unlike any other day, but I think this day uh, in 2003 when the decision was made to commit troops to Iraq was probably the second most intense day for me in my, during my eight years. And that day started out with a meeting in the Situation Room, the President meeting with uh, his entire national security team, uh, Secretary of Defense, and. Secretary of State, and, uh, and I was standing outside the room thinking that, you know, maybe something could be happening that day, and, um, and the meeting ends, and you can actually kind of, there was a peephole at the time, this is before the Situation Room was renovated, you can, you can kind of gauge when the meeting was breaking up. So I was standing outside the door, the door swings open, the President bolts out of the room, and I literally had to jump out of the way not to collide with him, I didn't even have time to lift my camera. And his face was right in front of my face, and I saw his eyes. I saw they were red. Uh, he was nearly crying. Um, and I followed him. He walked through. He walked up the stairs, through the Oval Office, and he walked outside and walked the entire circle of the South Lawn with the dogs. Um, and then, uh, right after I made this picture, you can see the weight of the decision still on his face. He spoke to me, and he said, Eric, are you interested in history? And all I could say was, yes, sir. And he said, these images, these photos you're taking are very important. The one in the Situation Room and the one here on the South Lawn. And just as he said that, out of the corner of my eye, I saw uh, Don Rumsfeld, the Secretary of Defense, and Vice President Cheney came walking out of the Oval Office. The President walked over to join them. And they uh, later, I found out, they're discussing the timing of the start of the war in Iraq. which later that evening, in a national address, the president uh, let the nation and the world know. One of the untold stories is how much 
compassion the president has for the troops that he sent into harm's way. That there are this dozens and dozens of meetings with injured soldiers at the hospitals, at Walter Reed, at Bethesda. A lot of them were private meetings, um, didn't, didn't get a lot of press, uh, but he took every, every uh, 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 opportunity to meet face to face with uh, the troops. And at this moment here, this is a injured soldier. He just gave him the Purple Heart and he leaned over to kiss his head. So I think one of the things I'll miss the most in my job is flying an Air Force One. I mean, I have to admit, I, I really wish I would have been able to get air miles. <laughs> but uh, unfortunately, the government doesn't work that way. Uh, air Force One is like a flying White House. Uh, this is one of the uh, one of the secret trips to Iraq, the, the second trip, the, the president getting aboard the plane un, under the cover of darkness. That's uh, inside uh, the conference room of Air Force One, which you can do almost anything on that plane. And uh, a lot of strange things happen on the road. <laughs> this was actually the. Uh, the official delegation for the funeral of Pope John II in Rome, and the Clintons were there, and uh, his father and mom were on the trip. And through the eight years, uh, I was able to observe and document the president's relationship with world leaders, like uh, the Japanese Prime Minister, Koizumi, was his favorite. He really enjoyed his company. Koizumi was the leader that he took to Graceland, because uh, uh, Koizumi was a great, uh, he's an Elvis fan. That's uh, one of our last visits to uh, 10 Downing uh, with the new British Prime Minister Gordon Brown walking up the stairs. And those black and white portraits are uh, portraits of uh, all the former prime ministers. You can see Tony Blair is the last portrait. who He had just stepped down days earlier. This is uh, <laughs> Prime Minister uh, Omer from Israel. And this is in, in um, uh, Jerusalem, Jerusalem in his office. And, Omer wanted to find out who was taller. <laughs> one, one of our trips to Normandy, France for uh, the anniversary of D-Day. This was a, uh, a trip to Albania, and uh, the president was welcomed as a hero. He was the first sitting president to visit that country, and kind of wondering what those agents are thinking at this moment. <laughs> but we survived. <laughs> Uh, the final chapter in my book uh, is called Sprint to the Finish, and, and it's not by accident. Uh, the president would always say um, at the end of the administration is he's going to you know, do his best all the way to the end. He's, and he, he'd always, it was a quote, basically, that he'd always say, I'm going to sprint to the finish. So I thought that was a great uh, name for the, the, the last chapter. Uh, and this is uh, one of the final moments in the Oval Office in November of uh, 2008, right after the election, and this is the, the transition meeting, the uh, starting the handover of power, and that's President-elect Obama in the Oval Office for the very first time. And in order to make this picture, I had to set up a remote camera, because I was actually on the other side of that coffee table taking a picture of the meeting, uh, but I had a remote camera sitting on the mantel over the fireplace in the vines kind of hidden um, as a backup. And I really needed it because it was a very tense meeting, and they didn't allow any other staff. And, uh, and I'm sitting there waiting, you know, waiting for a moment. There's two of them talking, but they're looking at me like, okay, are you done? <laughs> like they really wanted to get down to business. And uh, so as I left, uh, I was able to make two frames on my way out, and that's one of them. And this doesn't happen every day. The five presidents together. This is in January of... Uh, 2009, uh, about maybe a week and a half before the inauguration. And the 43rd president leaves the Oval Office for the last time. So for, for years, I, I always wondered what this moment would be like. Uh, you know, the final moments, I thought they'd be emotional, that would be hugging and crying. I thought that uh, it, it was so far from that. Uh, it was very simple. I think the president made a couple of phone calls. Uh, I, think, I think his only visitor was uh, the chief of staff and at the time. That was Josh Bolton. And you can see the clock there. It was about 8 o'clock in the morning. And, and the president called for his coat, and he said, I'm going over. 
and he turned and walked out without looking back. And uh, so that's the last picture of my slideshow. Uh, and what I'd love to do is, is open it up to questions, if you have any. Front row here. Yes. Uh, were you the first digital photographer? Well, um, I guess technically you can say um, the first 100% digital uh, that I, I directed that transition, which uh, took a long time to design. And luckily, after winning uh, the second term, we were able to use the system. So, so most of the images are film in the first four years, and then we made the cutoff. The second term was 100% digital, and that was definitely a chore <laughs> because it was it was just an added job to to complete during everything else that was happening. So it was definitely a, but I'm but I'm happy to say that that system is being used today in the White House. So um, very proud of that. Yes. Um, as an instructor of photography, I'm curious: do you shoot Canon or Nikon? Um, <laughs> well, it's interesting. In the film days, I shot Nikon. Uh, and Leica, which was a, a bonus uh, uh, when I first started in the White House. But once digital, uh, Canon was leading uh, in the, the technology and the quality, and so I'm a Canon guy now. <laughs> yes, sir. You said photos are in a database. Are those photos, photos accessible online? You know, there, um, there are a few photos accessible. Um, not every, the system is not accessible, like the entire archive, you have to actually uh, go in and, and put in a request for research. Um, but uh, there are a select few images that are, that are available when, when you visit the, uh, the library website, including um, uh, the photos on the, the, the White House website, which is frozen in time, you know, as is, uh, because we, we released a lot of pictures on the White House website. And that was another place where, for digital, which really helped um, in that process. Yes? So, was a good portion of your day spent recording the details about each picture, or the situation, or was the error, the timing, that kind of thing? You know, um, I was lucky enough to have a, a lot of, uh, of background for, you know, I had the, had the schedule, I had some briefings, depending on uh, the nature, you know, like n nothing uh, classified or, or national security, but, but I knew a lot ahead of time, uh, so I can predict some of it. Uh, and then, you know, waiting around for the surprise moments, which I really enjoyed the most. But, but I did my homework, uh, in most cases, knowing what, what to expect, the movements, uh, which there's a lot of logistics behind the presidency that people don't see. You know, if I if I would turn around to take a picture behind me, <laughs> you would see a whole lot of people <laughs> in the background that, that support the president, uh, from the military to the civilian um, uh, career people that work in, in the House uh, to all, obviously the political appointees. Tremendous amount of people, the best and the brightest, uh, that support the president. And, and you realize what this country is about when you travel and because no no one travels like a U.S. president, no one has the size, the no one has the presence. Um, uh, well, maybe Japan has a couple of 747s, but but nothing matches Air Force One. Uh, but uh, it's incredible uh, the amount of support that the president has, uh, and, and I really enjoyed working with a lot of those people. Yes, sir. Yeah, I had a whole crew of people to help me, to help run the office. I had four other photographers. I had a photographer assigned to the vice president, a photographer assigned to the first lady, uh, and the other photographers helped uh, me uh, cover the president's schedule, which was always, you know, 24-7, basically, because, you know, a lot, there are a lot of social events that would happen. Um, just to give you an example, so around Christmas time, there were nearly... 25 Christmas parties, and a Christmas party for the president means standing in a receiving line for two and a half hours every night, <laughs> uh, greeting 
hundreds of people, and everyone was photographed, and that was a huge operation. Uh, and I needed a you know a great staff to help me run that operation. Uh, but anytime anyone would meet the president, uh, required uh, you know turning that photo around, and it was really important to President Bush. He felt that giving a photo of that moment uh, was was uh, enjoyable for him to give people photos, uh, and it was really important to him. He, he really loved to to personalize personalize those photos, and uh, he kept me on my toes definitely. In the corner. You mentioned you had five photographers, which is the same number that President Ford had, interestingly. It's my understanding, if I've heard correctly, that President Obama has 14 photographers plus a videographer, the first in history. Do you know what the current situation is? Wow, that's the first time I've heard that. <laughs> that's a lot. <laughs> I'm not sure. Uh, I haven't heard that there are that many photographers, but, but the interesting thing is uh, the, video the videographer is a new addition to uh, just the evolution of, of the White House. Um, uh, I don't think that videographer has ac the same access as the White House photographer, but it, we didn't have anything like it, really. We, we had a White House TV that was mainly run by the military that would cover events, but, uh, but not follow the president around. And how many pictures total did you and your colleagues shoot in the, in the eight years, just out of curiosity? We ended up with nearly four million pictures in the archive. Four million. Yes? Did you have total access, or were there any rules for you to like, leave after a certain point? Or was it well, it was kind of on-the-job training. Um, and you know, kind of had to learn the hard way in a lot of cases. Uh, but after a while, you kind of the president had a real routine, and which the staff loved, uh, and, and I tried to kind of develop a routine with him. Um, and through the years, I would learn, you know, when not to be there. You know, I would definitely tread lightly around the residence, for example. But there were meetings, official things going on up there. Um, anytime I was around the family, I was always invited by Mrs. Bush. Uh, but I always realized just how little time the president actually had with family, how little personal time he had. So I, I tried not to make him feel like, like I was always there watching him. You know, I tried to really pick and choose my moments. But it was really, this really came down to he and I. And we, we kind of had like a, like a nonverbal uh, communication a lot. You know, like, like I can tell what, what kind of day he was having just from the tone of his voice or the expression on his face. And, they, and I would kind of know. Or a lot of people would say uh, the, the president would, would would give you the look, you know, which, you know, could like shatter glass, you know. It's like, <laughs> so if you ever got the look, then you kind of know that, you know, maybe you shouldn't be there. Um, but but he, the, the best thing about President Bush, he was very direct, so you didn't have to wonder. You know, he would let you know. Yes, sir, or Miss, ma'am. How much time were you able to spend at home? <laughs> <laughs> oh. Yeah, yeah, that it was tough. Uh, you know, it's 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 a type of job that was just all consuming. The best part was having a very supportive wife, who actually worked in the White House as well, which helped tremendously. She worked uh, for three years in the in the Office of Global Communications, so she understood, you know, uh, the inside. Um, but yeah, my my life was basically the president's schedule. So, and I and I tried to delegate as much as possible. Like I, I didn't go on every trip. You know, like if. If there was a trip to Chicago in the winter, I would definitely, you know, <laughs> send someone else. But, you know. Yes, ma'am? It sounds like you built a relationship with, with uh, President Bush. Do you, are you in contact at all anymore? Keep in touch? Yeah, my, you know, my official role with him is over, but uh, I, I always volunteer to help him in Dallas with uh, the Bush Center. He has lots of events for uh, for veterans and uh, other other programs. Um, you know, he didn't hesitate to write the forward for my book, so we worked worked very closely with he and Mrs. Bush on on my book. Uh, and uh, so I, I do see him every every now and then. You know, it was great to see him in the library, and and uh, and who knew that he would be an artist? You know, <laughs> which uh, surpri surprises me in one regard, but then again, like everything he does, he does 110 percent. So you know. <laughs> Yes, sir. Is campaigning as grueling as it looks day after day after day? 
Yes. Yeah, that was a very close election. I mean, again, uh, it was an election that was not decided that night. Uh, and then Kerry made the call to concede um, the next morning. Didn't didn't drag out too long. Um, but yeah, yeah, election or campaigns are very grueling. It's it's and it, it just becomes one big blur after a while, especially um, you know the the final week. There are just you know four or five stops a day. Uh, 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 and to be honest, I don't know how, I really don't know how President Bush did it. I mean, he, he's in incredible shape, I think, for starters. Um, and he liked to get his sleep, which was great. And the staff loved that part, too, because it was not, <laughs> he was not a night owl, <laughs> but he was an early riser. <laughs> but um, but he, was, he was very disciplined. Uh, he made sure that he got his exercise, and, and if that was not built into a schedule, you wouldn't know about it, because he's not happy if he wasn't exercising. But, uh, but yeah, he's in incredible shape, very, very disciplined. Yes? Three things, if I might. You're the president of the nickname celebrity. Did you have one? Of the four million pictures, do you have one that stands out? Uh, let's see. that picture of the two presidents, is that available? Um, yeah, I think, I, I think the, the library is, has that available, that portrait. And, uh, uh, the, that information is classified about my nickname. Um, actually, no, I never had a nickname, to be honest. Nothing ever stuck. It was just always Eric. <laughs> yes, sir. What was your relationship with the daughters? I mean, were they cooperative, or did they not want to be cooperative? Oh, they were great. They're wonderful people to be around. And, and it was interesting because we didn't see them a whole lot, to be honest. Um, uh, when he started uh, his first year as president, they, they went off to school. Um, and I think uh, Barbara was in New York and Jenna was in Texas. And they would come for you know, family gatherings and they will come and visit during the breaks in, in the school year. But we didn't see them full time. So, uh, but, uh, but the whole Bush family were, were great. I, I loved hanging out with uh, his brothers. I, I, you know, when I lived in Alexandria, his his brother Marvin just lived down the street from me, and I would see him at Starbucks almost every morning. <laughs> you know, no one knew, but it was great. But uh, but great a great family to hang out with. Yes, sir. Did the uh, president uh, veto any of your original pictures for the book? Um, you know, there was some fine tuning. Um, nothing nothing major, really, and. Um, I think uh, I think Mrs. Bush had more control than he did. <laughs> She's the real boss. <laughs> yes. I think the pictures that I will always remember are the ones of him with his dog and with the, the five presidents together. How human! I mean, they may be presidents, but they still. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And that and that's what uh, you know. I had that opportunity to to witness and and hopefully, you know, a body of work like this shows more than what you normally see, uh, and it it gives the full picture of of, of a president. Yeah. yeah. Exactly. Thank you. One more. Yeah, um, I've got one for you. So it's actually in the book. Uh, it's it's one of my favorite stories. So, um, so for me, you know, I was a, a photojournalist with the AP. Learning the job was you know trial by fire. You know, I had to learn learn on the job. And and the very first day, so you have uh, after the swearing in ceremony, there's a moment when the uh, outgoing president is saying goodbye on the steps of the Capitol. And typically, the president that just is leaving it gets on the helicopter and leaves. Well, that morning, this is in you know 2001, the weather was so bad that the Clintons couldn't fly. So there was a motorcade sitting there in front of the steps of the Capitol. Well, for some reason, 
uh, I started following the Clinton entourage. And it gets worse. I, I actually end up sitting in the motorcade in one of the vans. Because I guess I, I, maybe I switched back to uh, my, uh, my uh, AP days or something. So I'm sitting there thinking, you know, it's, something feels wrong. You know, this is like... <laughs> This is not right. I don't, I don't recognize anyone in this car. What's happening? Uh, and then I'll never forget, there's a, a, a photographer on the Clinton staff. His name is Ralph Allswang. And he said with a very dry voice, he said, uh, Eric, your guy is staying. <laughs> and uh, luckily, the, the door didn't close, uh, but I leaped out and uh, I saw the President Mrs. Bush walking up the steps of the Capitol and I caught up like nothing, nothing happened. <laughs> Front row. Yeah, I did. And there, there's some photos in the book. Uh, uh, yeah, yeah, his great, great moments with his, with his mom. Uh, there's a picture, the last flight to Texas, and uh, he's leaning on his mom's shoulder, um, and you can see other friends and family in, in, inside the plane. And um, yeah, she was she was a lot of fun. And I, I don't know if you remember that one photo of her with the camera. She uh, she actually shot digital in the White House before I did, <laughs> and uh, and she would use that camera. She would take a picture of. Uh, She'd always want a photo with me and, and the presidents together. I'm like, great, right? And, and she would deliver it with, you know, with the, the photo signed. You know, it's like the next day. I mean, it's like she was very efficient. <laughs> yeah, I loved her. She's great. Yes. Uh, no, um, no access to the White House. My, my past doesn't work anymore. <laughs> it, uh, that's all over. Um, I'm now, uh, I moved out of Washington. I'm back in Albuquerque, New Mexico, where th that's home base, where I, I have a freelance photography business, and I do lots of uh, work for corporate clients and some editorial clients and some wedding clients. It's a, it, it's a mixed bag, which I like. I like the variety. And then I'm still kind of in the political circles, uh, I actually jumped in at the end of the Romney campaign, and I was his photographer for the final uh, four months of that. And, uh, and so you never know. I might, might be back in it. You never know. <laughs> I was going to ask you, would you do it again, like if Jeb runs? Uh, first of all, you have to ask my wife. <laughs> she, she'll, she'll give you the answer. <laughs> Um, that's an interesting question. You know, in the film days, uh, nothing was deleted. Nothing was thrown away. It was, you know, you had the negative to hold in your hand, and uh, all the outtakes were, were, are there. Uh, everything is considered a presidential record. So when digital rolled around, uh, I used that same uh, uh, thought that, uh, that nothing was to be deleted, including outtakes. Uh, everything is a part of the archive. Um, you know, all the out of focus pictures and uh, everything's there. Yep. Yes, ma'am. Did you get to photograph Jen's wedding? You know, I, I missed it, unfortunately. Yeah. It looked great. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Any more questions? Well, thank you all. I really appreciate Oh, do we have one more? I saw a hand. Um, oh, uh, you talking about the Boy Scout? No. Oh, oh, uh, you mean when, uh, when he first walked in? Yes. Uh, that's a great question. Um, so that is the nephew. His name is Walker. Uh, and at the time, I'm, I'm not sure how old he was, uh, like 11 or 12. Um, but now he's like 6'3". <laughs> He's a Marine. He served in Afghanistan. I mean, it's amazing to watch the family grow up. But yeah, that, that, that is the son of, uh, 
Marvin Bush, his brother. Thank you. Well, thanks everyone for coming. Uh, we have a couple of our trustees here tonight, Marty Allen, trustee emeritus, and uh, David Hugendorn's here joining us tonight. In the lobby, you'll have a very special treat, White House cookies. There will be book signing uh, with, uh, with Eric's book. Uh, go out and you'll, those of you who have not seen it, it is absolutely spectacular reading material and visual pictures to see the history. Uh, I enjoyed it very immensely uh, doing it. Uh, Eric's been here before, uh, from a number of you remember, uh, Eric was here with a couple of other White House photographers, uh, David Kennerly, and we always give our uh, President Ford Pence, so Elaine and I had to put our thinking cap on and what we were going to do. Well, David Kennerly did a similar book a number of years ago, and uh, Trustee uh, Ambassador Secchia was kind enough to buy a supply of these books, and there's some very special autographs in this book, and so Eric, on behalf of the Foundation Museum, will present you with this very special book, and what a delightful presentation. Uh, many of you will not know, because uh, he's very modest, but uh, he chose not to sit in his hotel room here, but to go out and visit students at a Junior Achievement event at Davenport College today, and uh, what just, it was marvelous, and the students were riveted in their seat. What a wonderful role model, and thank you so much for going out in the community day and spending your time in the community with us. So, uh, again, thank Mercantile Bank for this wonderful event, and uh, thanks, everyone, for coming. And, Eric, let me have the honor of giving you this very special David Kennerly book.